advice I'm going to give to you too. Uh, phase one starts this spring. So back to you, Candace. <laughs> As for me, I was born on Tree 8 territory in Northern Alberta, but I saw the light half a lifetime <laughs> ago and came to Saskatoon a couple of times, actually. Um, I come from a long line of chronically unsettled settlers, but that rolling stone has come to a rest here. And one sign of that is this book, mm -hmm. Prairie and Natural History, um, which is a sign of my my need and desire to put down roots in this place. So I guess more to the point of this talk this afternoon, um, like Joanne, I'm also a gardener and um, my partner Keith and I over the last, especially five or six years have been converting our front yard, our backyard and increasingly mm -hmm. our boulevards <laughs> into um, little oases oasises, um, little patches of native plants as refuges for pollinators and other creatures. So Joanna and I have been um, asked today, invited today to talk about gardening for wildlife, but our real subject is about living respectfully in this place, honoring the creatures that are naturally here and caring for them and restoring them as much as we can. And obviously within the context of a city, there's a limit to what we can do. We can't restore the land to its full ecological function or its full beauty. We're not talking about restoring a herd of bison to Stonebridge or a, a, you know, a pack of wolves in Holiday Park. We can't do that. But what we can do is restore um, the plants that belong in this territory to their natural um, habitat, to welcome them home. And so in if, that's what we're going to talk about um, <laughs> under this, this umbrella of gardening for wildlife. Um, and in a few minutes, Joanne is going to talk about the practicalities of how you get started making this transformation. But before we get to that, I'm going to talk a little bit um, about why, why is this important and why are we doing it and why are we encouraging you and everyone to um, join in this growing trend. And now through the miracles of technology mm -hmm. and through, yes, after having practiced several <laughs> times, <laughs> I am going to attempt to share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Hooray. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. There we go. <laughs> so here we are, gardening for wildlife. But what Joanne and I really have in mind is gardening for insects. So gardening for wildlife really begins with a shift in thinking. As gardeners, we've often been taught to think of insects as best. But as the ecologist and entomologist E.O. Wilson famously pointed out, insects are the little things that run the world. So consider this summary from Nature's Last Hope, a recent book by the entomologist Douglas Tallamy. He writes, insects pollinate 87.5% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants, What's more, plants turn energy from the sun into food that we and an unimaginable diversity of birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and freshwater fishes need to exist. Insects, Douglas Tallamy continues, are the primary means by which food created by plants is delivered to animals. Insects sustain the Earth's ecosystems by sustaining the plants and animals that run those ecosystems. <clears throat> by this, this, um, this slide was made by um, Dr. Linda Gullickson, who is a gardening expert from BC. And yeah, under the heading of very bad news about insects. 
Over the last 30 to 40 years, insect populations around the world have dropped precipitously. Global monitoring of 452 species showed a 45% drop in insect populations since the 1970s. And then you can see there on that graph, the top line is the Lepidoptera, butterflies and moths, and the terrifying bottom line, all other invertebrates over that span of 40 years. And the bad news just keeps coming. When people talk about an insect um, apocalypse, this is what they're talking about. A review of 73 studies worldwide found dramatic rates of decline that may lead to extinction of 40% of insect species over the next few decades. Extinction rates for bees, ants, beetles, eight times higher than that for mammals, birds, and reptiles. And the consequences, if we just look at birds, the consequences are terrifying. So there at the bottom of this graph, which is from the State of Canada's birds in 2019, you see that precipitous downward trend in grassland birds. That's our birds. And even lower, you see the declines in aerial insectivores. That's birds like swallows, birds that rely on insects. And just this last week, there was a report from um, Wilson's Bulletin, a major ornithological journal, um, with the unsurprising news that the decline of insects is responsible for these declines in insect eating birds. Now, I know you didn't come here for bad news. And this is very bad news. But as with so many other things, we take a deep breath and we start to think about what we can do. Mm -hmm. What can we do to support insects, these crucial links in our ecosystems? Well, obviously we support them by providing them with the resources they need to survive, including the plants that they eat. And for the most part, that means native plants for native insects. And I have to apologize for showing you a pansy with this <laughs> particularly um, caterpillar on it, but um, well, they, it's standing in, in this instance for a violet and it worked. So let's start with butterflies. Ever since we were little kids, we've known about their amazing life cycle. We know how they lay eggs, often on plants, hatch into caterpillars that eat specific plants, transform into pupa that overwinter, often in leaf litter from plants, and emerge as butterflies that need nectar from plants. Since native species evolved with native plants, it follows that we need to provide a diversity of plants to support a diversity of butterflies. We also need to embrace the mess in the form of leaves left where they lie to provide critical wintering habitat for them. Every stage of this life cycle is important, of course, but the caterpillar stage is the most critical for that energy transfer that we were talking about earlier. Birds need caterpillars, huge quantities of caterpillars. Even birds that eat seeds <laughs> as adults feed caterpillars to their nestlings. Hundreds and hundreds of caterpillars and other soft-bodied insects, easily as many as 800 coming to a nest in a day. By creating a garden that supports caterpillars, you are supporting birds. Now, most butterflies are fussy about the plants on which they feed. And Douglas Ptolemy and his students um, in 2018, they did a study um, in, on their university campus on which they compared the number of caterpillars produced in a natural area on the campus, which turned out really to be introduced bushes and other introduced garden plants, 
with actual natural areas dominated by locally native, um, locally native plants. And they found that the introduced plants were ecologically sterile. They produced 96% less caterpillar biomass than a similar area of native plants. So yeah, here we are, that the alien plants um, produced 68% fewer caterpillar species, 91% fewer caterpillars, and 96% less caterpillar biomass. So by planting native plants, you are planting um, food for birds. And, and Joanne in a few minutes will go into more detail about what which plants. So you will, of course, from now on, start to rejoice when you go <laughs> out into your garden and you see that caterpillars have been eating some of your plants. Of course, there is another um, important function that goes on in gardens. Um, that doesn't require this kind of shift in thinking. We're already familiar with the role of insects as pollinators. And so oh, something that we may not realize is just how many different kinds of pollinating insects there are around. Butterflies, of course, perform that function, but we probably have several hundred kinds of bees in, in our yards and gardens. Um, in this region. And here you can see a sweat bee, that beautiful little iridescent green guy up at the top, um, a leaf cutter bee carrying pollen on its belly, and a bumblebee um, with a flower spider there. Um, I'm not sure I noticed that before, very interesting, um, in a plant in our backyard. So um, this is a, another pollinator. Of course, butterflies and moths do provide pollination services as well as bees. Um, and this happens to be a hummingbird moth feeding on a giant hyssop plant in my backyard. So very exciting. But the heavy lifters when it comes to pollination are bees. So maybe just to take a half a second here to talk about the other kinds of um, black and yellow things you might see buzzing around in your yard. Um, there are flies that look very much like bees, hoverflies you, you see here, but you'll be able to tell a fly from a bee because flies only have two, two wings, not two pairs of wings, two wings, short antenna and great big eyes. Um, the critter there on the right side of your screen is a wasp. Again, morphologically, you can tell usually from the wasp waist. They have two pairs of wings, as do bees. But the difference between bees and wasps is that wasps, which do provide some pollination services, they are primarily carnivores, and so they're hunting for insects to eat. Um, and that's also why they're so direct so attracted to our barbecues and picnics. Um, they're much more aggressive than our bees, which are vegetarian, and they are entirely dependent, bees are entirely dependent on plants for both um, sugars and for the proteins that they, um, they receive from um, pollen. So many kinds of wild bees can sting if they're disturbed. Bees are not typically aggressive. And so, yeah, that's an, an important point to keep in mind. And these little critters, the bees are really the power, the powerhouses of pollination. Many, it's something important to keep in mind is that many of the garden plants that we're used to planting, you know, the ones that we go and buy in the spring at the garden centers, they have been um, bred for show. Um, so they could just be, they're very intensely ruffled and they may not actually have any resources at all for um, bees and other pollinating insects. So it's really important, not just to, um, to have 
uh, native plants in your garden, but to be thinking about the, the form and function of the plants that you have there. In general, simple open flowers um, are going to be much more um, successful in supporting insects. And then in addition to, um, in addition to ha having lots of flowers, you're also going to want to provide um, bees and butterflies, these insects with a source of water as well. So some um, um, is it very shallow so that they don't just drown. So um, most of our wild bees are solitary bumblebees. Bumblebees do form colonies and they'll nest in an old boot, in a mouse nest, in a, a mulch pile. But most of our wild bees are um, solitary. They may nest and lay their eggs inside hollow stems. They um, may be in the ground. And so leaving some areas of our gardens that are untended and undisturbed, especially a nice south slope, these, um, these are really important aspects of gardening to support insects. So embrace mess. Go organic, lawn be gone, grow native flowering plants. Those are some of the things that we can do to respond to the crisis that we're facing and to support flourishing populations of insects in our gardens. And now I'm going to hand the microphone over to Joanne, <laughs> who is going to um, lead us through the hows of doing this, how to get started. Thanks, Candice. Yeah, so first of all, um, getting started. What do you do first? Well, if you're fortunate enough, fortunate enough to have a yard, the first thing to do is take a good look at your space and spend some time in it. Uh, where do you plan to grow some native plants? Is it time for some lawn eradication? That can be fun. Um, how much space do you actually have to work with? And what's the sunlight like? And Pay attention to whether it changes over the course of the day or the seasons. A sunny area in the spring can be uh, totally shady in the fall once the, once the trees leaf out. Um, pra and prairie plants do love sun. So look at where the shade is. Now, if your yard is shady, and many of us who live in the older areas of the city will experience that, if that's the case, do not despair. There are things you can do. Um, so first step, spend some time in this place where you plan to grow. Sharon Blackie is an Irish writer and a strong believer in rooting deeply to the place where you live, wherever that might be. She encourages people to learn to know and to love. Yes, no matter how hard you think it might be, the place where your foot first falls when you step out the door. Know the place where your feet are. So that's where we start, where we are. Now this is a photo of the place where my foot first falls when I step out the front door. It shows mostly the south side of my yard from the step. Our house faces west, so it's in part of it, part of the yard's in shade from the house in the morning. Then it gets some shade from some shrubs to the south in the afternoon. Uh, looking to the west, there's a city elm, which will cast some shade later on in the afternoon. But also, it's interesting, as the sun moves round to the west in the late afternoon and comes in low, it gets very intense and sunny in the spots closer to the front of the yard. So there's some interesting challenges there. Um, one day, this will all be native flowers. No, you say, but I don't have room in my yard or you don't have a yard and you'd still like to grow some native flowers. Well, think about some other places that you might try. Um, for instance, your child's schoolyard. Many of them need some beautification and it's a great educational uh, opportunity. There are some schools who have already made native plant gardens. Alleyways can be great places if you have alleys and if there's room. 
what about the front of your church or in front of your workplace? You know, the place where people hang out and drink coffee and drop cigarette butts. Well, maybe you could turn that into a nice uh, wildflower place. Uh, container on your balcony or your front step can work for a few flowers. And then there's city boulevards. And you see right there a city boulevard, the space between the city sidewalk and the road. Uh, the city of Saskatoon is currently revising their um, boulevard gardening guidelines and native plants are part of the picture. So just imagine what this strip of grass would look like filled with native flowers. You don't need that box there, it's, it's for vegetables, but it could be a great um, neighborhood block party event and it would be thoroughly beautiful. Take a walk on the wild side. So go on out to a natural area and walk and spend time there. We have so many of them in and near Saskatoon. There's the Northeast Swale, Cranberry Flats, Beaver Creek, Crocus Prairie, Chief White Cat Park. There's many places you go along the river where it's a bit more wildish. So, Go out there at different times of the seasons in, uh, or different times of the year too and see what's growing there. Who likes to grow with who? Under what condition? Like which plants grow at the edge of little bluffs or shrubs or trees? Who grows out in the open? Um, observe up close and out far and just kindle your joyful curiosity and enjoy. Now, site preparation. This is really important before you plant anything, particularly if you have a lawn to dig up. Uh, first, uh, first bit of advice is start small. Really set yourself up for success. Three feet by three feet, that may not seem very big, but uh, you can get a lot of plants in there and it's a lot of work at first and you wanna have a success. Um, so for eradicating your lawn, first of all, no poisons. Lots of digging. You can either dig up your lawn by hand or rent a turf cutter. Take the uh, clumps of soil and shake the dirt off into the space below, uh, making sure to pull out grass roots and quack grass roots, that sort of thing. Now, there's different ways you can go about it from here, and a lot of it is really site-specific. And you may get different opinions even from, from different practic practitioners about this. Now, in a sunny area, plant your plants straight into this. Um, you can then sprinkle native grass seeds in between and throughout. Uh, if you want only flowers, plant the plants densely like maybe four inches apart. Although you do need to take into account how big the plants are gonna grow and how quickly. Uh, another way you can do it, and this is perhaps more for shady areas, is plant the plants, then cover the space between the plants with cardboard. Be sure and wet the cardboard. You don't wanna waterlog it, but you want to wet it because you wanna get, actually you wanna get the biology growing. You, uh, those little microorganisms in the soil will munch it down and you actually want it to disappear over time. For a while it'll act as a bit of a weed barrier but um, you do want it to break down so don't put it down dry. Then you can put wood chips or dry leaves over top of that and fill in spaces. It will look, it'll look really nice. Now uh, one thing to do though is leave Leave a few bare spaces, that, as Candace mentioned, that's uh, uh, helpful for um, ground dwelling bees. Okay, I think, yeah, oh yes, either way, you are going to have to stay on top of the weeds because you're gonna get weeds. I mean, that's a fact of life. Um, they're in the soil, they blow in, birds drop them in. And if you don't keep on top of them, uh, they can over on the place and then you'll be sad and possibly give up on, on native plant gardening. So please stay on top of the weeds. If you don't have the time or don't want to, get someone else to do it for you. 
Now, deciding what to grow. There, out at the Northeast East Swale, there's over 200 species of native plants growing there. We can't invite them all over to our house, at least not all at once. So how do you actually decide what to grow? Well, uh, Douglas Ptolemy, who Candace mentioned earlier, he has pointed out that there are some native plants that just support a far greater variety of um, larvae of butterflies and moths than others do. So he suggests go with them, go with those native species, or go with those uh, plants that will feed the most caterpillars, the most variety of caterpillar, which in turn will feed the most birds. Now, this screenshot is actually a, from a website of the National Wildlife Federation, the US uh, organization, but it, it has what's called a plant finder, where if you live in the US, you can enter your zip code and you hit the button and it'll come up with pictures of the plants in your area that support the most butterfly and moth larvae. Now, that's of limited utility here in Canada. However, Candace came up with a brilliant idea and that was she found a town just sort of south of the border, Haver in uh, Montana and entered, which is, would be a similar kind of uh, ecosystem to ours and entered in the zip code and up came a number of plants that grow here. And they are the plants that we might want to start with because they're going to feed the most caterpillars, to feed the most birds uh, in our areas. So what have we got? Uh, there's goldenrod. Many kinds of goldenrods live here and uh, they're a great plant to plant. Wild strawberry. Uh, wild strawberry forms a nice ground cover and it will sp spread quite quickly by runners. Uh, it will also grow in some shade. Wild blue flax, uh, it just keeps blooming and blooming a good part of the summer. It does like shade and it loves caterpillars. Uh, violets, uh, pictured here is early blue violet. Uh, there's also um, Western Canada violet, which grows here. And these are two more plants that will uh, grow in shade. So on to, oh yes, forgot to mention, also wild sunflowers and sages. They also support lots of, uh, lots of Lepidoptera larvae. And don't forget about the trees and shrubs. Trees and shrubs, native trees and shrubs support a vast number of insects, insect larvae. Um, at the top of the list in our area are Saskatoon berries, wild roses, the green ash tree, native willows, Manitoba maples, the pin and, and choke cherries, as well as, uh, as native dogwoods. So um, if you have room, you might want to think about planting some trees and shrubs. Um, if you live in an older area, you might already have a Manitoba maple or even a green ash in your yard or nearby. Uh, just make sure if you are going to plant trees and shrubs that you've got room for the mature, uh, mature plant. And another thing which I learned via experience, and that was that Shrubby native, native plants sucker and they spread rapidly um, and they don't necessarily stay in one place. Uh, space I planted to shrubby native plants, wildflowers and some grasses over 20 years ago is now a lovely shrubland and with a few flowers around the edges. And as I said, it's a lovely space, but it's not what I envisioned back at the beginning, and I didn't really think that far ahead. So that's something to keep in mind. One thing before we go on this one, if you notice the, the green ash tree, those little half moons are actually created by leaf cutter bees, um, not by larvae. And the leaf cutter bee will take these little chunks out of, out of plant leaves, uh, roll them into a cylinder, and then seal them with her saliva. She inserts them into stems or rotting logs, so another good reason to 
plant standing or have a few logs around. And she deposits her egg there along with some, some pollen. Uh, now, something really interesting that I just learned the other day from a webinar, I was watching that a researcher was studying leaf cutter, uh, leaf cutter bees, and they, they will use leaves from plants that are non-native as well as native plants. But what he found was that every single native plant leaf type had antimicrobial properties. So that meant those leaves were protecting the larvae from uh, disease and parasites. And uh, I just think that's pretty awesome. That's another good reason to grow native plants. Now, uh, what about the pollinators that Candace talked about earlier? They too need uh, pollen and um, pollen and nectar, and Chet Chet Newfield is the um, executive director of the Native Plant Society of Saskatchewan. He uh, has identified four plants that he calls uh, super plants, and says these are the native flowers that are literally mobbed by just about anything. Please, and what are those four? Uh, first, we've got wild bergamot, which I think you saw in some of Candace's slides. Um, tracks native bees, butterflies, moths, and flies, as well as humming, hummingbirds. Uh, giant hyssop, this is Candace's picture again. And uh, it attracts uh, bees, butterflies, hummingbirds as well. Meadow blazing star, uh, butterflies love its nectar. Hummingbirds visit them too, and goldfinches and other birds eat their seeds. In this picture is Canada milk, milk vetch. It's the plant closer to the front. The one behind is prairie sage, gone really tall for some reason. Um, but Canada milk vetch is the nectar source for bumblebees, attracts hummingbirds, songbirds, butterflies, and it's also food for animals like uh, rabbits and deer. And being a legume, it fixes nitrogen. Um, oh yes, I well, just mentioned bergamot and wild, wild bergamot and hyssop will also grow in shadier places. Oops. Okay. One moment while we see why this doesn't want to advance now. Oh dear, we can't learn about shade. <laughs> Hmm, technical. Ah, okay, ah, there okay. We go. Right. <laughs> oh, what about that shade? Uh, as real grassland plants love sun. Um, that's just where they grow. But some are adapted to a range of conditions. Um, for instance, I have seen star flowers, Solomon's seal, growing out in the open prairie close to Beaver Creek, um, just you know, outside of Saskatoon. And I've seen it growing up uh, at the forest edge at, up north at Nest Creek. Not all plants do that, but some do. Um, bergamot likes full sun, but it'll do well in flower and partial shade. I've, it does that in my backyard. Uh, many flowered asters is another one that will do that. Now this list, which we're going to put into the, sh into the chat, so that you can copy it and, and see it later. It shows plants that will grow in partial shade. Uh, some of them I see growing in my own yard where it's somewhat shady and the rest have been plants that have been recommended to me by people who know what they're talking about. Okay, now next, succession of blooms. Try to uh, plant, uh, keep plants you know, plant plants so that you will have a succession of blooms throughout the seasons, all the way from crocuses in early spring to asters and goldenrods in the fall. That's another reason to keep on going out to these natural areas because you get to see what's blooming when. Now, where to get native plants and seeds? Uh, first of all, uh, never dig them up in the wild, leave them where they are. Uh, buy locally as much as possible because these are the plants that not only are native to here, 
They've grown here, they're adapted to here. And we're really fortunate to have Blazing Star Wildflower Seed Company close by. Uh, it's Rennie and Lisa Grills. Uh, they are, are out of Aberdeen and they sell both uh, seeds and, and plants. Um, you can go to their website. Uh, you can order seeds online. If you're interested in plants, it's probably best to drop them an email and just ask them what they have available. Usually if, if they're selling seeds, they're usually growing those plants, but it's best to check with them and see what it is they have and let them know uh, what you would like. And they are just ever so helpful and knowledgeable and all around wonderful. Uh, another good source is to talk to other gardeners of native plants. Often people have seeds or extra plants and they're more than happy to share them with people. Now, sometimes you may need to go further afield, but stay as close to home as possible. So within probably uh, Manitoba and Alberta. And this, these uh, four plant sellers, uh, we'll also put them, their information in the, in the, in the chat. Uh, three are in Alberta, one is in Manitoba. They're reputable. They really know what they're doing. Um, they sell both seeds and plants. And I know the three on the left, Alcla, Wild About Flowers and Prairie Originals sell uh, grass seeds and plants as, as well as flowers. I'm, I'm not sure about Arnica, but uh, they are worth checking out. Beware wildflower seed packets. They are so lovely and tempting, aren't they? Wildflowers, but the question is wild to where? This one says North American mixture, but look at these red plants. That's corn or field poppies. They're native to Europe. Chives, which there are alliums are, that are native to here, but not these guys. Um, they may contain some plants that are native to here. They're generally a mishmash of all kinds of plants, and some of them may actually be invasive. So leave them on the shelf. There is a lot more that we could talk about and in a lot more depth. Uh, but I will just leave you with these takeaways. Start small and set yourself up for success. If your space is large, do it in stages. Plant a succession of blooms. If you have lots of sun, consider adding native grasses. Uh, they provide habitat for lots of wildlife and they, they're flowering. They also provide uh, uh, food for pollinators. Um, don't worry. Oh yes, you'll need to weed, tend, and water, especially in those first few years. This is not no maintenance, especially at first. Don't worry if you eventually need to disturb your plantings by thinning or moving plants. And if you have to thin plants, you can always give them away to friends and other people who want to start wildlife gardening. Watch and learn and adapt as your garden evolves. It will be fun. Enjoy. Uh, a few local resources, and again, we'll put this into the chat. Native Plant Society of Saskatchewan, Chet Neufeld is the executive director. They, if you go to their website, you will find a plethora of resources for educators. You'll find plant lists, uh, plant inventories going out at places like the Northeast Swale and the Natural Grasslands in Saskatoon. There are back issues of their newsletters, which are very informative. And you can also become a member, and, um, um, attend workshops and conferences that they hold. Again, Blazing Star Wildflower Seed Company, who we talked about. Uh, Lichen Nature is a business owned by Elizabeth Bacoli, and she does ecological design, consultation, impl implementation, and education. She is ever so knowledgeable about native plants and ecological design and is a, a brilliant ecological educator. Uh, and we have a few books. Uh, there could be many more, but we just have to stop somewhere. And again, these are a good site, good start, including the Saskatoon Nature Society's Guide to Nature Viewing Sites. 
in, our, in and around Saskatoon. So now we are almost done. I'm just gonna talk a bit about some Wild About Saskatoon events that are coming up soon and they're related to our talk today. Uh, coming up this week uh, on March 31st, we have our second Nature City Conversation. This one, we'll be talking to um, Jesse Best and Katie Burns from the city of Saskatoon and um, Andrea Laplante Mewasin, of the Mewasin Valley Authority, Mewasin Valley Authority, about the um, Saskatoon's green infrastructure strategy. It starts at seven in the evening. You can, um, reg you have to register uh, in advance. It is free, you register through Eventbrite. Coming in May, we'll have our third Nature City Conversation. And this one is about growing, growing with native plants. And we'll have native plant at experts, Chet and Candace Newfeld, as well as Rennie and Lisa Grills uh, from, uh, from Blazing Star. So uh, if there's things we haven't covered here, this can go in more depth into growing native plants. And I think it'll be very worthwhile. Then in May, we're uh, releasing another Nature City adventure, adventure Guide, this one on creating a pollinator paradise. And that'll be Candace and me doing that. You can go to our website to see more details about these. The May events won't be posted yet, but they will be as as um, get closer to the date. So check it out and see what else we're doing. So that brings us to the end of our presentation. Uh, those are some of the pra practicalities of growing native plants. As Candace said earlier, growing native plants really does represent a shift in our thinking. We're not just gardening for us, we are growing for the rest of the natural world. And those of us who are growing native plants are creating a new norm for city yards and gardens. Uh, we're helping to create diverse, messy, lively, and gorgeous spaces that support so much life. The, these places are also teaching and learning places. And they tell a story about our relationship with the natural world. It's a story that's, that's vastly different from the one communicated by controlled monocultural green lawns. We are bringing plants back to their native territory. They are taking root where they belong. And we are beginning to take root and to belong to this place as we take up some of our responsibilities towards the natural world. So thank you very much. and. Um, if there's time for questions, we'll answer a few questions if we can. Thank you so much, um, Candace and Joanne. I really enjoyed that presentation. I learned a lot and I loved all of your gorgeous photos um, that we got a chance to see. So thank you for that. Um, I do see one question currently in the chat. Um, if folks are wanting to ask questions, we do have time. So feel free to pop those. Um, it's probably easiest if you put them in the Q&A. Um, section rather than the chat, just because we've shared so many resources, it'll be easier for us to see them. Um, and if you do also want to ask your question live um, to our speakers, you can just use that raise hand button at the bottom of your screen and we will unmute you so you can ask um, the question. So the question that I do see right now in the chat um, is from Mars. The question is, will woodland lupin grow in shade? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I know prairie lupin, the silver <laughs> lupin will grow in the sun in the most disadvantageous places you could ever imagine, but never in my yard. I know that. <laughs> but I don't know. So maybe we, you, do you know offhand, Joanne? I don't know offhand with a name like Woodland. I would yeah. guess it might, but I don't know for sure. Yeah. So maybe we could ask for more information. Like yeah. Where have where have you seen this plant? Because that's the way you learn. Um, yeah. It's, and it is one of the things I love about doing this kind of gardening. So you get to know the plant so much better. 
when you have them close all the time. Ah, there's Mars. Yes, I think, <laughs> um, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Candace. I didn't mean to cut you off there. Well, I was just gonna say, you get to know them so much better so that when you do see them in the wild, in their, you know, it, in their, their natural communities, you can observe so much better um, and how they're growing and who they're growing with. And you just get to know them so much um, more personally. Mm -hmm. hey, uh, I purchased uh, woodland uh, lupin from a fella at the uh, farmer's market a number of years ago. And I've had it in, the, in my yard uh, in the sun on the south side and it's done really well there. Yeah. Um, but I have an area in the front that I would like to convert to woodland or to flower native plants that grow in shade. And I wondered about the, this lupin because with the name, as you said, woodland, you think maybe it would like a little shade. Yeah. Yeah. This it, it's on the north side, so it does get some sun in the late afternoon, mm -hmm. but not a great deal. Well, I would start by uh, learning, you know, looking the plant up in a good guide to Saskatchewan wildflowers and determining whether or not it actually is native to this yeah. area. Yeah. Um, and then watching the plant also and seeing what kinds of insects come to it. Then you would know if it's something that you want to expand or if maybe it's not quite as ecologically active or as indigenous to this place as you were hoping for. Okay. There's so much of this that's based on observation and learning. You don't start out knowing what you're doing. <laughs> At least I didn't. <laughs> no, I didn't either. <laughs> and still sometimes. Well, yeah. Well, thank you. I'll do that. Yeah. Hey, thanks that's for the great. question. Yeah. Um, there is another question in the chat now from Susan. Uh, the question is, I have a southeast facing balcony garden by the sea. Any recommendations for insect friendly plants? I'm imagining that Susan is not in Saskatchewan if she's by the sea. Um, yeah, probably not. Eh? But maybe the, the question is sort of in regards to a balcony garden or, or more of a containerized garden for insect friendly plants. Um, Susan, you're welcome to, to raise your hand if you want to come on and uh, and share a little bit more about what you're you're working with, but um, we'll pose that question to Joanne and Candice. Yeah, well, first of all, I would say like there are certainly there are plants you can grow in containers, but if you're living by the sea, uh, you're not here. Um, what I would do is um, again for your own area, uh, find a field guide to na plants native to where you're living. And then uh, from there, you might be able to narrow it down to plants that would do well in containers. Um, I, because I, I can't really give you any advice about seaside plants, but um, the place that I would start if, if I were there is to find some field guides and plants, uh, find out about plants that grow in that particular area. Um, Keith and I have created a little roof garden. We have a shed in the backyard and through much main strength and awkwardness we managed to get a plant box up there. It's only about 10 inches, whatever that is in centimeters, newfangled centimeters um, deep. So and and it's um, exposed and a very challenging growing situation. Um, but we have discovered a few plants that um, that survive there and even a couple that managed to thrive. Um, wild strawberries, mm. um, kind of, um, I think they would be fine in a container, but that's a bit of an extreme environment for them. Um, Harebells, the wild bluebells, they look so filamentous and lacy and translucent. They are tough as nails, those things. They bloom up there. They're just amazing. Um, so they can manage with the roots without their roots being tremendously deep. Um, hairy golden aster, which is a kind of mat forming um, 
plant with yellow flowers. It will grow and bloom and spread up there um, as well. Northern bed straw um, hangs on. It's not really super happy, but it survives. So those are some um, it, native plants that will grow in even in that extreme kind of mm -hmm. container situation. Um, so I just wanted to add to that, that um, someone has suggested to me, and I, I haven't grown them in containers, but that native alliums, like native onions, huh. might do well in containers. So Susan, in your seaside area, if you have any native onions or garlic type plants, they might be an option for, for growing in a container. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think of Black-Eyed Susan's? Um, kind of, of, yeah, I don't know. I've not tried it. Yeah, it's been suggested to me that they might do well in containers. And like I said, I haven't tried containers for native plants, so I don't know. The thing about a lot of these prairie plants is that they have really yeah. deep roots. It's exactly. part of their yeah. evolutionary strategy for dealing with the, the periodic droughts that mm -hmm. we have here that just the reason that this place isn't a forest, it's <laughs> a droughty, extreme climate that we have. So, yeah. So I don't, I don't think you can't assume that they will all um, manage well. But no. you know, with this little green roof idea, for instance, it's experimental, mm -hmm. and so you could be finding out things that that nobody knows yet about the conditions yeah. under which these plants will yeah. grow. I mean, I want to, I want people to be able to grow giant hyssop and bergamot and gallardia in pots because they're so beautiful and they um, uh, attract so much insect life. Yeah. So that would be worth experimenting with. Yeah. So I got the lilies, the, the wild red, um, the tiger lilies. Western red lilies, they, yeah. they don't seem to have too many root requirements. Maybe they would be happy in, in containers. Yeah, yeah, that might work. Awesome, well, thank you, Susan, for the question and thank you for the discussion and the suggestions. I think um, the idea of experimenting and trying and trying again is <laughs> really an important one. So um, I think that's a really great piece of advice. Mm -hmm. um, thank you both very much for your presentation.